Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Sukanya Balakumar, and I welcome you all to this global lecture series organized by the Center for Research in Emerging Economies of Jindal Global Business School at Global Jindal University. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Patricia Gomez Gonzalez. Dr. Gomez Gonzalez earned her PhD in economics from MIT. She's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Fordham University and a fellow at the Rimini Center for Economic Analysis. Her research lies in the area of international finance and macroeconomics. In particular, she studies public debt structure with an emphasis on inflation-linked public debt and sovereign debt crisis. Some of her work has focused on monetary policy in open economies. The topic of Dr. Gomez Gonzalez's talk today is optimal public debt indexation in advanced economies. In her work, she studies optimal public debt management when governments can issue inflation-linked debt and nominal debt and aim to minimize tax distortion. And she shows that debt investors are risk neutral and nominal debt carries a convenience premium. Before I ask Dr. Gomez Gonzalez to start her talk, there are a few housekeeping rules which I would request everyone to follow. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams turned off at all times. Um, Dr. Gomez Gonzalez will take your questions as and when she pleases. So mostly we'll be taking the questions towards the end of the talk. We do have a Q&A session towards the end. In the meantime, feel free to raise your questions in the chat box and we will take it accordingly. Dr. Gomez Gonzalez, thank you so much for accepting our invite and we are so eager to hear you. The stage is all yours, Doctor. Thank you so much for those kind words and that introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me to be, give this talk and all of you for being here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about optimal public debt indexation in advanced economies. So the presentation talks about inflation-linked public debt. And this market has actually become quite big in the recent years. Uh, the amount of inflation-linked public debt that advanced economies have issued has gone from about 52 billion in 1995 to around 3.4 trillion in 2018. So this is quite a dramatic rise in the importance of these markets because the amount of public debt that advanced economies um, issue is so large, this amount of debt actually represents around 10% of total advanced economies public debt. And when we think about this type of debt for governments, a lot of the models we have think about governments that strategically use inflation to deflate, not to erode, the real value of their public debt. The intuition being that when you increase the price, no, when you increase inflation, the real repayment, no, repayment over the price level is going to go down. This has then two implications. The first implication is that we should see that inflation in these countries is countercyclical, meaning that inflation goes up in crisis, in bad times because it's precisely there where the government is interested or more interested in deflating away the real value of its debt. The second implication is that inflation-linked debt would be cheaper to issue because it's not subject to this strategic choice of inflation. And what I mean by inflation-linked debt being cheaper to issue than nominal debt refers to beyond expected inflation. So uh, let me be clear. Now, of course, nominal debt is going to uh, require a higher return from investors because investors need to be compensated for inflation that they sort of uh, bear that risk. But what these models say is more than that. They say, well, investors should also be compensated to bear this risk. No, investors do not like to hold risk, so they would need to be compensated additionally, not only for inflation, but also a sort of risk premium to bear that risk. However, when we look at the data for advanced economies, turns out um, inflation is often procyclical, meaning it goes up in good times instead of bad times. And inflation linked rates, when we control for expected inflation in the economy, turns out it's actually too high. Um, and people have interpreted this as 
inflation-linked debt being a more illiquid asset than nominal debt. Nominal debt having some special attributes of liquidity that inflation-linked debt doesn't have. And hence, investors, to hold this type of debt, they need to be compensated and illiquidity premium. And, and this um, sort of difference between what's cheaper to issue can be meaningful, no? can be large, especially if you think of maybe recessions like the one we're be, uh, in now, where there's a lot of government spending, there is a lot of um, need to uh, issue debt and sort of choosing one or another instrument, nominal debt or inflation-linked debt, has the potential to save governments billions when they need to repay. So because of this mismatch a bit between a lot of the models we have that probably are thinking more about emerging economies or, or economies where the distinction between monetary policy and fiscal policy is not very clear. Uh, what I do in this paper is propose a different framework to be, think about inflation-linked debt in advanced economies. The key elements of the model are first, that there's a government that needs to finance some government spending and wants to minimize tax distortion. So it has to tax consumers, but wants to tax them as little as possible, let's say. The government here is not going to choose inflation strategically. Instead, it's going to take inflation as given. You can think of it as chosen by the central bank. Um, the government issues nominal debt or inflation-linked debt or both. No? Debt investors are, um, for the most of the presentation, I'm going to concentrate on risk investors that are risk neutral. I'm working right now on risk aversion and there are some results in the paper about that. But most of the talk today is going to concentrate on risk neutral debt investors. And finally, nominal debt has some sort of special attributes. You can think of it as liquidity, very easy to resale, to um, keep its value. Uh, and these are attributes that only nominal debt has and not inflation linked debt. In a framework like this one, um, what the paper finds are sort of some properties of the optimal share of inflation linked debt in public debt. Uh, I find first that inflation linked debt share, the share of public debt linked to inflation is increasing in inflation volatility meaning the higher inflation volatility, the more inflation linked debt government wants to issue. Why is this? Well, because the government cares about the real repayment of its debt, meaning the nominal value of the debt over the price level. If volatility of inflation is very high, this means that the repayment of nominal debt is very high, is you know, the, the sort of volatility of the repayment of nominal debt is high, the government dislikes that because that means that it produces more tax distortions and it wants to move away from nominal debt towards inflation linked debt. The second find it, finding is that the share of inflation linked debt is decreasing in the convenience premium, this sort of uh, convenience that nominal debt provides. What is the intuition for this? Well, the more, um, investors value nominal debt, the more the government can raise from issuing nominal debt, so the less is going to have to issue of inflation-linked debt. I also find that the share of inflation-linked debt is increasing in inflation. So the higher inflation is, the less investors will value nominal debt. So the less they're going to pay for this nominal debt. That means that the government raises less from nominal debt and is sort of forced to issue more inflation-linked debt to raise the revenues it's need, it needs. And finally, I find um, something that I call, or that you can think of as inflation hedging. And what do I find? I find that the share of inflation-linked debt is decreasing in the correlation between government spending and inflation. So, let me uh, stop here for a second to say, what do I mean by this? Well, suppose that the correlation between government spending and inflation is very low. Suppose, for example, it's negative. What does that mean for the government's budget? 
Well, for the government budget, this means that when government spending goes up, inflation goes down. Now, if inflation goes down precisely where the government has to pay a lot in government expenditures, this means that the government also would face a higher real repayment of nominal debt. The government doesn't like this for its budget, right? Because it would need to pay more of nominal debt precisely when it's also having to face higher government spending. Because the government doesn't like this, the lower this correlation is, the more inflation-linked debt is going to want to issue. So these are sort of the theoretical um, predictions of the model. I then bring these predictions to the data and I look at the uh, advanced economies that issue inflation-linked debt and find in the cross-section evidence consistent with some of these uh, theoretical results. First, I find that countries where inflation volatility is higher actually do issue more of their debt linked to inflation, like the model predicts. Second, I find that countries with higher inflation also issue more inflation-linked debt as part of their public debt. And finally, I find some evidence consistent with countries hedging their budget constraints, not their budgets, basically. Why? Because I find that countries where the correlation between government spending and inflation is more negative are precisely the countries that issue more inflation-linked debt, moving away from nominal debt that has these sort of properties of exacerbating budget problems exactly when the government doesn't want that to happen. No. Um, so this project is related to a number of trans in the literature and, and I don't want to devote uh, too much time uh, on this. Instead, what I'll do is sort of tell you a bit going forward how the presentation is going to go. I'm going to have a part on data where I sort of present um, how much debt has been issued, the behavior of inflation, and I'll devote some time to review the finance literature on the costs of inflation-linked debt issuance versus nominal debt issuance. I'll then present the model results and the comparative statics that I just previewed in some more detail. And to conclude, I'll show you the cross-sectional evidence consistent with this comparative statics. So, um, if there are any questions in the chat, I am actually not seeing the chat. So if there are no questions there, I can continue to the data. Yes, there's no questions as of now. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I lost a bit the, the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, um, let me start by presenting the data. I have data on the inflation linked debt outstanding for 14 advanced economies between 1995 and 2018. The sample covers all advanced economies that issue inflation-linked debt, except Greece, because they don't have this data publicly available. The data is yearly. And I also add to this data information on GDP, government expenditure, and inflation. And the time coverage of these macro aggregates that I'm interested to think about inflation behavior or how inflation relates to government spending, the time coverage uh, depends on sort of when each country started issuing this type of debt. And as a sort of curiosity, let me uh, show you these starts dates. So here you have the countries in the sample and the uh, period in which they uh, each of them started issuing this type of debt. Uh, the first ones to do it was Israel, Iceland, and New Zealand, later in the 80s, Australia, uh, the UK as well started issuing this type of debt. Uh, the US, for example, it started in 1997, which by the way is I think when India also started. I think India started issuing part of this uh, inflation linked debt in 1998. And I'll talk a bit more about it just for reference. So, um, so in the 90s, as I was saying, no, uh, the US, Canada, France as well. And there are a number of countries, no? the more recent ones, I guess, are Japan and Spain no? in 2013 and 2014. 
So there's a bit of variety in when the different countries uh, started issuing uh, this type of debt. And uh, as I was saying, no, the data, the macro aggregate data will sort of take each of these start dates as, as the beginning of the sample. So let me give you a snapshot on how much debt each of these countries issue. This table reports no, in the second column, the share of public debt linked to inflation for each of the countries in the sample. The last row shows what I was saying in the beginning, which is that on average, this type of debt represents about 10%, 9.5% of total public debt in these advanced economies. Um, there's a lot, again, of variety. No? United Kingdom, Israel issue 24%, um, 25% uh, of their public debt in this manner. Also, for countries like Iceland and Sweden, these are also popular, popular debt instruments. But other countries like Japan or Korea issue a very small amount of uh, public debt. Which, by the way, for reference, um, I have worked a bit on emerging economies, inflation-linked data as well. And India sort of is closer to the Japan, Japanese or Korean experience. So they issue less than 1% of their um, public debt in this manner. So um, what, what do I find in the, in the time series? What I find in the time series is that this type of debt has become increasingly popular. So the third column in this table shows that almost all these countries in the sample, except Iceland and Israel, actually have increased between 1995 and 2018, the share of uh, public debt that is issued linked to inflation. And some increases are uh, sizable, not 13 times, 14 times. On average, the share of inflation linked debt over total public debt has increased by about five times. And it has not only increased in terms of public debt or in terms of the share of public debt, but also inflation linked debt as a whole. No? And that would be the last column in this table. You see that there has been huge increases in the sort of total amount of inflation linked debt that these countries have issued. No? So the US has in increased uh, its, the amount of inflation linked debt it issues by 43 times, uh, 20 times for Italy, France. On average, that is about 11 times no? for the average sort of advanced economy. Um, and you see here, maybe I can show the time series now, that the, there's been some ups and downs, but for the most part, as I was saying, no, all of these countries have experienced this sort of upward trend, again, with, uh, with the uh, exception of Iceland and uh, Israel, no? that have sort of ended up 2018 issuing less than they started issuing in 1995. The rest sort of have seen this upward trend in the importance of this type of debt. As I was saying, when we think about inflation-linked debt, a lot of the models available now think about uh, governments being strategic about their inflation choices. And if that is the case, then, like I was saying, inflation should go up in bad times during crisis, which is when the government wants to uh, get rid of some of its real repayment of nominal debt. When you look at inflation for advanced economies, turns out that inflation is pro-cyclical in many advanced economies. Here are the countries uh, in my sample. Uh, and what I'm reporting here is the correlation between inflation and the detrended uh, real GDP. Each of these sort of correlations are calculated using the subperiod in which they issued this type of debt. And what you see is that for many countries in the sample, the correlation is positive and actually quite sizable no? for countries like Spain, US, or say Canada. No? There is this evidence that for several countries in the sample, inflation goes up in good times, not in bad times, no? sort of um, going against that intuition of wanting to erode the real value of your debt in, um, in bad times, not in good times. The second um, 
the second sort of evidence that I want to bring up is the evidence coming from the finance literature. So um, there is a sort of large literature comparing the issuance cost of inflation-linked debt versus nominal debt. Uh, most of the literature has, come, has sort of focused on the US and the UK. And as I was saying, it is reasonable that nominal rates, you know, that uh, investors would need to be compensated for inflation, you know, for sort of uh, this expected inflation that they are bearing that risk. But turns out that when you actually control for that using surveys of expected inflation, turns out that these adjusted inflation link rates are actually above nominal rates. You now having this impression and this idea that inflation linked debt is actually more expensive to issue than nominal debt is. The way this has been interpreted is that inflation linked debt is a more illiquid asset. So maybe during a recession, it's harder to resell it uh, and maintaining its value, for example. So then inflation linked debt, um, investors need to be compensated for this uh, illiquidity by getting an illiquidity premium on their investment. Now, the finance literature has actually been quite um, open to what they mean by illiquidity. No? They uh, include things like assets novelty, the fact that when this ad asset starts being issued, people maybe don't understand it so well, don't, I don't know, trust it initially so well until they understand the asset better. And the reason they, they sort of interpret this liquidity in this way is because this liquidity premium has been higher in the US and the UK when these countries started issuing this type of debt. So for the US in 1997 and a few years right after then when it started issuing, for the UK in the early 80s when they started issuing, no, the premium was higher in those periods. The finance literature has also found that uh, this liquidity premium has been higher during the financial crisis of 07, 09, pointing at illiquidity also uh, encompassing maybe these episodes of flight to safety, you know, where people just prefer to hold uh, nominal debt. Maybe it's what they understand, what they see safer. So, an important thing to keep in mind is that this illiquidity premium is actually um, sizable. Let me, I think I see a chat question. Uh, does country the government spending be in effect? So, great question. I'm going to talk about sort of how uh, government spending depends on inflation. And I guess ultimately, because inflation also depends on output, we can sort of talk about how these three things relate to one another. Uh, and it's an important channel of the model I'm going to present. Uh, let, me, let me talk about it uh, when I present the model. The, thank you. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, let me defer for a second. So um, as I was saying, no, it is... Um, sizable, this liquidity premium is sizable. There's this paper in the Journal of Finance that has concluded that the US could have saved billions if instead of issuing nominal debt, sorry, if instead of issuing these treasury inflation protected securities that it issues, it would have just instead issued nominal debt. No? And here you have some sizes of this mispricing. Uh, and in the paper, they say you know, that for every $100 of debt, uh, the US needs to raise about $3 more in taxes to repay inflation-linked debt than to repay nominal debt. No? So this can be sizable, as I said, especially for countries that issue a lot of debt and in periods like this one, no, when there's a lot of debt issuance as well. The paper, um, uh, this journal finance paper, interprets this um, mispricing as saying, uh, well, the special attributes that we think public debt has, this typically we think of it as being specially safe, specially liquid, maybe actually only applies to nominal debt no, and not so much to inflation-linked debt. That's how the Journal of Finance 
paper sort of make sense of these findings. I think there are uh, a couple more questions in the chat. Um, so yes, Bishop question says, how do interest rates are affected by how much of this debt gets issued? So typically for public debt, what happens is that the more you issue in many of these advanced economies, it seems like the rates go down which is uh, somewhat surprising, no? but it sort of has been pointing out precisely in this Krishnamurthy, Vincent Jorgensen paper, that actually public debt is almost close to money. No? It has some sort of special attributes that people really want to hold. Whereas in many emerging economies, it would be a bit the opposite. You know? The more you issue, uh, the closer you might be to default. No? But this seems to say that for many of these advanced economies, probably especially the US, people investors don't see this um, sort of um, debt as something that can be defaulted upon. No? And then the more there is, the more they value it almost, no? because there's this impression that if we all hold it, uh, it's sort of more liquid. No? Um, oh, very good question. Uh, legal environment of the country and debt issuance. Absolutely. No? So this, the difference, or is there an, some relationship? Absolutely. So this, um, the paper here concentrates on advanced economies, especially enough for what I was saying in the beginning, which is a lot of the facts of the models we have probably apply more to um, emerging economies. So already there, you can see a huge distinction no? between what inflation does, what we think governments are doing when they choose inflation or um, the separation maybe between fiscal policy and the central bank matters a lot for this type of um, regimes and how this debt, this public debt works. Having said that, Arushi, um, between advanced economies, it seems to me looking at the data that the experience is a bit more um, at unison. No? So they, they are more similar. The big distinction is between sort of advanced economies and emerging economies. No? Um, between um, advanced economies, maybe the US, the UK are even a bit more special, but a lot of what I'm talking about here, so for example, this um, finance literature on inflation linked debt issuance costs has concentrated, as I say here, especially in the US and the UK, but there is some work looking at um, other advanced economies, almost all the advanced economies I have in the sample here, and they find similar things, you know, that especially for medium term, say five uh, years, seven years, uh, inflation linked debt is uh, more expensive to issue. What I mean by that is that after controlling for expected inflation, inflation link rates are too high in comparison to nominal debt. Um, yeah, so excellent question now about um, unforeseen events and sort of, uh, or pandemic recessions. So the perspective I'm taking here, uh, Mandira, in, in the model is that you don't know when you might need to increase government spending, but you do know the correlation, you know, a bit what um, I think I should Kaurua was uh, asking before as well about countercyclic and government spending, no, for example. So this idea that um, you know, ultimately, you know the correlation, or you know how these series behave um, in general, or when, like this thing I was presenting of inflation and 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 an output. No, you so you know that for many advanced economies, uh, say you're a U.S. Uh, you're the U.S. Treasury, you know that in your country, inflation tends to be pro-cyclical. Uh, and you might know also, I'll show in a second the data now, you might also know in the UK that the correlation between government spending and inflation is negative. So in that case, now you're interested in issuing uh, more inflation-linked debt. And we can think a bit more about what happens between output and inflation and then that relationship with government spending. Um, so these things are all unforeseen, to summarize, all of these things are unforeseen, but um, the agencies that issue this type of debt know how the series typically behave. You know, they know the correlations, and that's what's going to be important for, for the public debt management questions that I'm going to ask in the model next. 
um, excellent. Um, thanks for those questions. So let me now present the model. Um, I'm going to oops, I'm going to present here a sort of summarized version of the model. Um, there are two periods in the model. It's a pretty simple model. Uh, one good in the economy. And there are basically two agents, uh, households or consumers. As I said, households are risk neutral for most of the presentation. They get an endowment. You can think of this as GDP you know, uh, in real life. Uh, they pay some taxes and they invest in debt between the first period and the second period. No? So they buy the debt uh, in the first period and get repaid in the second period. And of course, they have two choices. No? They can either buy nominal debt or buy inflation-linked debt or buy both. The, their utility function looks like the equation I'm presenting here. Notice that, as I said, investors are risk neutral. They just want to maximize expected consumption. Um, the more they consume, the happier they are, no? and there's no risk aversion. But there is a last term there, which is this B function, that is going to capture um, in a bit of a reduced form the findings in the finance literature. It's going to say, look, nominal debt, so this BN, I should have said, BN denotes nominal debt. Nominal debt brings some um, liquidity services, some um, special properties that investors really value, but mm, inflation-linked debt does not. Inflation-linked debt does not. I think I saw a question, let me mm, pull it up. Yeah, so about uh, emerging markets. So will the response of fiscal policy to the public debt and the implications of the greater volatility, what will be, sorry, what will be the response of fiscal policy to the public debt and the implications of greater volatility in an emerging market? So um, I'm going to talk a bit about sort of the references here uh, with emerging markets. Um, some of the findings in this model probably pass through to the emerging market as well. I'm going to show you some things on sort of emerging market inflation volatility, or sorry, inflation volatility in general. Um, but I think for emerging markets, a lot of the work that has been done sort of concentrates especially on the response of monetary policy to public debt. Now, meaning that when you have, as I was saying, when you have nominal debt, when you issue nominal debt, there is a big temptation to, uh, erode that real repayment by increasing inflation. Here, I'm not going to allow for that. Uh, I'm going to just have inflation taken as given. But this is an, the response of monetary policy to public debt is an extremely important driver of sort of public debt composition in emerging economies. And I'll talk a bit about the volatility. About the volatility. So some of the papers that I sort of just mentioned in the beginning or I showed in the slide talk about some of this. Here, I concentrate more on advanced economies. Uh, but we can talk a bit more uh, when I present, the, for example, the scatter plots. Maybe we can have some uh, conversation there. Excellent. So um, as I was saying, no, this B, uh, BN, no, this sort of liquidity services that nominal debt provides, uh, is only for nominal debt, not inflation-linked debt. What is the benefit of this modeling choice. The benefit is that uh, you have very clean um, representation or characterization of debt prices. So here you have uh, inflation-linked debt, debt prices QI, QN refers to the price of nominal debt. And what you see is that for risk-neutral investors, inflation-linked debt is safe. Why? Because they just get repaid in units of the good. No, they don't have to worry whether tomorrow the dollar amount repays them more or less in purchasing power. No, they just get, get paid the uh, one unit of the good. So for risk neutral investors, inflation linked debt is just the safe asset. For nominal debt, uh, what does the price of nominal debt shows? Well, the price of nominal debt shows that nominal debt becomes less valuable the higher inflation is. 
intuitively, if you get paid one dollar and there is uh, inflation, well, that dollar is going to pay less in purchasing power to you. So you're going to value it less. And also uh, the price of nominal debt and hence how valuable it is to investors decreases if it's sort of liquidity services decrease, which is this V function there. From these debt prices, what you see as well is that if I sort of uh, erase this V function, the difference between debt prices can only be explained by, by expected inflation. No. If people are risk neutral, it's only expected inflation that um, sort of can explain the gap between uh, the price of nominal debt and the price of inflation linked debt. For there to be any other gap different to that, it must be that we have another term, which is what this V function is doing here. Now, it's allowing for, if you want to put it like that, inflation linked debt being um, too expensive to issue given the uh, survey inflation expectations or what we think investors uh, have in mind. Let me take a few questions from the, is there an optimal debt to GDP ratio? Um, Yes, I'm going to show you in a second, uh, Deepika, I'm going to show you how that equation looks like. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you exactly how that looks like. What is the central bank in control? Yes, uh, and Iraq, yes, the central bank is in control of inflation. So maybe I should have said it here. This P1 uh, that you see in the slide is under the complete control of the central bank. And if you want to put it like that, mm, the central bank is not looking at public debt, no? which is the sort of strong assumption that maybe holds more or it's sort of safer to do in uh, advanced economies and might be less safe to do in some emerging economies, not all either. No? But, um, but here there's a central bank or something like this. No? Uh, you'll see in a second that what I do in the model in practice is that I take it as given. The government does not change P1 and um, it's sort of an exogenous pro, uh, stochastic process, no? A sort of, uh, yeah, some stochastic process. Um, Amisha's world economy is going through many geopolitical conflicts. Yes, so let me, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to say about uh, this type of, of um, sort of geopolitical conflicts or inflation debt issuance. I'm going to be able to say things about this type of bonds and debt to GDP ratio uh, and government spending. So in so far, you think that in periods like these ones, there's going to be more government spending when you're going to sort of be able to derive from the equations that I'll show in a second, some relationships. Um, let me talk about sort of inflation linked debt um, effects on, on frontier markets. And uh, when I talk a bit more about um, maybe how this relates to, to non-advanced economies, I guess. Um, so the second agent in the model oops, um, is the government. The government raises taxes uh, and issues debt to cover some stochastic government spending. So some uh, given maybe by circumstances, by say a pandemic or by geopolitical considerations. Um, I'm going to impose, so there's in the model, there's government spending in both periods, uh, T equals zero and T equals one, but I'm going to impose that the government spending in the first period is bigger. And you'll see in a second why I need that. Uh, taxes have a distortionary effect in the economy. And I capture this uh, in a very ad hoc way saying there's some quadratic cost of uh, taxes imposed in, to consumers, if you want to put it like that. Um, here comes prices. So prices, um, so the price level in the first period is P0, meaning um, P0 equals one, sorry, it's normalized to one. And then the price level in the second period, P1, is actually inflation, no? gross inflation, but inflation. And uh, it's going to affect the real repayment of nominal debt, because nominal debt in real terms repays whatever the government has issued over the price level. But as I said, 
and as one of the questions mentioned, it's sort of outside the control of the government. It's controlled by, say, some central bank. So in this model, uh, the government maximizes consumers' utility, which is equivalent to minimizing tax distortions. So let me show you finally no, the equations. Uh, I'm going to start to build some intuition where the with the case when there is no um, liquidity services for nominal debt. The benefit with that is that I can find sort of closed form solutions. I can solve it by hand. And this B refers to the optimal debt to GDP um, debt to GDP um, ratio. And what you see is that it's going to depend on the government expenditure levels. And here is where you see why I need government spending in the first period to be high enough. No, Otherwise, the government would decide to save towards paying some government spending in the second period. The second um, equation here, this SN, is the... Uh, share of nominal debt in public debt. And what you see is that first, it has this negative sign. No? So this means that if the covariance between government spending and the inverse of inflation, which is what's between you know, in the numerator up there, uh, if that is positive, this means that the government actually would like to save in nominal debt. No, it's not only that it, it advanced the country would not want to issue nominal debt. More than that, no, it would like to save in nominal debt. Why? Well, because it's beneficial for its budget. When government spending goes up, if the inverse of inflation also goes up, that means that uh, this asset, nominal debt, repays more precisely when they have more government spending needs in their budget. So they actually not only don't want to issue nominal debt, but they want to save in nominal debt. If you don't allow for that, uh, I'm ultimately not studying debt issuance. So in cases where that correlation in the numerator is positive, that would mean that there would be no reason to issue nominal debt if there is this positive correlation between government spending and the inverse of inflation. Um, to the right of the uh, nominal debt share, you have the inflation-linked debt share uh, solved as well. Let me talk a bit about the comparative statics that come out of this which are the ones I were previewing in the introduction. The higher the variance of inflation, which is in the denominator of nominal debt, the less uh, or the smaller the share of nominal debt the government wants to issue, which you know, relates to this idea of avoiding a volatile real repayment of nominal debt. You know? um, the second comparative statistics refers to the macro hedging of the budget, of the government's budget. Suppose that, so the lower the covariance between government spending and inflation is, suppose it's negative. Well, if it's negative, this means that when government spending goes up, inflation goes down. This is bad news for the budget, for the government's budget. It has to pay more in nominal debt precisely when government spending also goes up. So the government wants to move away from nominal debt, towards inflation-linked debt. And let me take the question in the chat in a second. Let me just talk about the last um, comparative static, which says the higher inflation, uh, the less investors value uh, nominal debt. So the more um, revenues the government is going to be forced, if you want to put it like that, to obtain from its inflation-linked debt issuance. Uh, do they, yes, inflation like that vary with the change in the interest rates. Yes. Uh, is there a safeguarding? Yes, absolutely. Are you so yes, in practice, actually, there is a deflation floor, they call it, they call it, where um, the inflation like that will always pay you, sort of corrected for inflation, but your sort of face value investment does not you never lose it. Through the lens of an optimal public debt management problem, that's a bit weird. No? That plays a bit to um, this sort of nominal myopia that we have, no? that we don't want to lose in nominal terms. But in reality, the deflation floor, again, is a bit 
playing to this idea that we don't want to lose the nominal value, but in reality, if there truly is deflation, we would stay the same. No? We would should be indifferent if actually our investment would drop in nominal terms because there is deflation. No? It's sort of less expensive. It's cheaper to buy things now than they were when I bought the bond. No, but for some reason, for example, the U.S., the U.K. as well. No, they have these deflation floors, um, and most advanced economies have something of that sort. You now to avoid people getting worried. Um, so, and here, no, these interest rates, how do inflation like that depends on the interest rate. So the way the model is built is a bit maybe reverse to what a lot of finance people would think about, which is that I've um, sort of set up the model in prices of debt. No? QN is the price of nominal debt, but that's the inverse of the nominal interest rate. No? So here, what you see is that the uh, nominal rate is going to affect the inflation linked uh, debt. The price of um, and sort of the interest rate on inflation linked debt is one when investors are risk uh, neutral. Um, so why does the market allow over borrowing? Please explain for both cases that tolerant countries and that intolerant countries. Um, great question. So I think you could think that this, this model here talks about mostly debt tolerant countries now. So here, I mean, I thought a lot of the over borrowing literature has looked about at, sorry, has looked at countries that end up defaulting. Here default is not possible. So in a sense, um, there is no over borrowing now. They, they are going to repay uh, and investors just will value in expectation what is going to happen, no? say the expected inflation or the liquidity services, uh, but they don't, uh, they are not sort of kept by, you know, taken by surprise that suddenly the government defaults. Now this is, the price level is chosen by the, by the central bank and there is not so much a sense in which people, or sorry, the government is over borrowing here. Um, great. Um, those are great questions. So, excellent. So, let me just say, I don't want to devote a lot of time in all these equations now. I, I don't think uh, I necessarily have the time that much either. Uh, you can then solve the model with actually liquidity services, no, for nominal debt. Uh, the equations are a bit more convoluted, not a lot more, no. Uh, this would be how the optimal debt to GDP ratio, you could think of it, um, is, or sort of the optimal value of debt is in the model um, with liquidity services. No? What do you find is that the more investors value um, nominal debt for its liquidity, the more, um, the higher the value, so the more the government will issue in debt, no? because um, if they want it, no, in a sense, if they value this asset, well, let me issue it. No, for me, it's beneficial. I get a lot of revenues from it, um, so the government will increase its debt issuance, which is probably what we're seeing. No, in the data in advanced economies, there is a big issuance of debt, and partly could be related. I'm not saying I'm explaining the whole increase, no, but I'm just saying partly could be related to the fact that investors value its liquidity. So um, increasing nominal debt and increasing inflation are both adverse circumstances, which is not very favorable. So according to you, can there be a balance the government can achieve? Um, yes, so I think what this model is saying is that um, the government can sort of, if you want to put it like that, this is a model of the best response the government has to inflation. Inflation is very high or it behaves in a particular way with respect to um, government, then there's a sort of optimal indexation of its public debt that it can do. But a bit related to Ayush's um, question, I think it was, no, what was, no, sorry, Amit's question. Here, nominal debt is not really bad news. No, they're just borrowing enough to cover some uh, government spending. Um, and there's no, 
sort of overborrowing or sort of default incentives or anything like that. This is more a model of the government uh, responding optimally to the inflation and the government spending it is faced with almost. No? It has some government spending that needs to cover, say a pandemic. It then has to, it has some inflation that is going on for a number of reasons outside the government's control. And then the uh, government issues some sort of optimal amount of uh, inflation-linked debt and nominal debt. Um, so the, the share of nominal debt um, has this sort of implicit equation, which again looks um, uglier than it is. Uh, let me just walk you through some of the terms here. The terms on the left-hand side are the same that we had before. This is the macro hedging behavior of the government's budget that the government wants to do. Uh, and then the variance term. And then on the right-hand side, we have these new terms related to liquidity services coming from nominal debt. So the first term is just the pure benefit of this liquidity investors get from holding nominal debt. The term after the tau zero are the benefits from lower tax distortions that the government can impose because uh, it's able to finance itself at a low interest rate, given that, again, no, people value their nominal, its nominal debt a lot, and they're willing to pay uh, more to hold this type of special asset. And the term in the last uh, row here in this equation is something similar for inflation like debt. It's saying, um, well, because the government is able to raise a lot from nominal debt, given that, again, investors really value this nominal debt, uh, it is able to lower its inflation-linked debt issuance. No? The more investors value um, nominal debt, the less uh, the government is forced to issue this inflation-linked debt. Uh, the, the sort of comparative statics, let me just say this, which is, um, I don't have enough time, I apologize, but I can, I can tell you that when you sort of abstract from tax distortions and this third effect I was showing with the inflation linked debt issuance, the comparative statics that I was showing in the model without liquidity services hold, meaning that uh, we should expect to see countries with higher inflation issue more inflation linked debt, uh, we should see countries with higher inflation volatility issue more inflation-linked debt. And by the way, some of the questions in the chat now that related to the volatility, maybe in emerging economies as well, these forces one and two are probably there as well for emerging economies, no? um, which is that if, if volatility is very high of uh, inflation-linked debt, well, investors might want it, want this type of asset less and Inverging economies might also be forced to issue more inflation like that. This is a bit of a conjecture because I don't have an emerging economy model, no, in all in, in, in all honesty. Um, and the third sort of cross-sectional uh, prediction is that there should be this negative correlation between the share of inflation linked debt and the correlation between government spending and inflation. So let's look at each of these. Uh, here is the cross-sectional plot for all the countries in the sample. And what I find is that there is some evidence of, again, countries with higher inflation, say uh, Israel, Iceland are the uh, outliers here. Without them, the plot still looks like a sort of positively related uh, sort of variables and uh, sizable still, no, 50%. So there is some evidence of, of this force in the literature, sorry, in the literature, in the data. Uh, the second test talks about inflation volatility and inflation linked debt. Again, there is some evidence of countries with higher inflation volatility, you know, higher. So this is the standard deviation of inflation is higher in uh, Israel, in Iceland. Uh, and those are the countries that also issue higher shares of their public debt linked to inflation. When you include Israel and Iceland, um, turns out the correlation still is positive, but much weaker. So there seems to be less evidence uh, when you 
don't account for those outliers. Having said that, then in this plot, no, New Zealand suddenly looks a bit like an outlier. No? So the question is, where do you stop no? shaving off outliers? So there seems to be some evidence consistent with higher inflation volatility countries issuing more inflation-linked debt. And finally, let me show you the macro hedging I've been um, uh, talking quite a bit about, which is this uh, relationship between the correlation between government spending and inflation on the horizontal axis and the inflation-linked debt share on the vertical axis. So what this is saying is that countries where the correlation between government spending and inflation is negative, say um, the UK. In the UK, again, the behavior of inflation is such that its budget suffers, let's put it this way, of having nominal debt. Because when nominal debt, real repayment goes up, it's also when the UK in the, its history has faced also higher government spending. So the UK doesn't like that. No? And what has it done? It has increased its share of inflation-linked debt. And it's one of the countries that has the higher share on average between 1995 and 2018. So again, this is consistent with this hedging of inflation hedging or inflation risk hedging of the government's budget. On the other side, what do we see? We see countries like Spain that don't seem to benefit that much from inflation-linked debt that indeed issue less of their public debt in this manner. Having said that, there are a lot of exceptions, of course. No? Um, this is a scatter plot, so there are countries like New Zealand and France with similar shares of inflation-linked debt, but also different correlations. No? So this is one of the drivers of um, inflation-linked debt. No? But this seems to show some evidence consistent with that behavior of the government hedging its budget constraint or its budget, basically. Um, let me conclude by saying that um, I hope I convinced you that inflation-linked debt is an increasingly relevant um, asset in advanced economies' public debt uh, portfolio. Um, the behavior of inflation-linked rates and the behavior of inflation with respect to the cycle seems to be inconsistent with um, models or, or frameworks where we think about the government strategically choosing inflation. Um, also, we know that in these countries, there's a sort of more independent central bank that chooses um, inflation maybe with less fiscal policy consideration in mind, no? without having debt in mind. And the model sort of um, highlights some advantages and disadvantages of inflation-linked debt. Advantages, well, the price um, is not eroded by inflation. So this is something that uh, investors like. Uh, the government avoids real repayment, a volatile real repayment. And inflation-linked debt is a good hedge for those countries like the UK where um, the correlation between government spending and inflation is negative. What are the disadvantages of inflation-linked debt? Well, investors for uh, some reason do not value uh, inflation-linked debt for these liquidity purposes. And also inflation-linked debt is a bad hedge if you are Spain, in a sense, no? if the covariance between government spending and inflation is positive. And I've shown some evidence consistent with this, some of these forces, no? uh, inflation, inflation volatility, and especially this idea that government might be hedging inflation risk um, in its budget by issuing inflation-linked uh, debt. Um, thank you so much for all the comments in the chat. Uh, I have to think more about a lot of what has been asked. I don't know if there's any more comments or or discussion. I think there's not that much time, but I can stay. <laughs> yeah, I believe uh, questions are pouring in. Let's uh, wait for a few minutes and see if there are. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, yes. No. I, I can. Uh, sorry. Yes. 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 Please continue. No. No. I was going to say that. I mean, I think a lot of the or some of the questions were about. 
intuitions that we have from uh, emerging economies, no, and how sort of inflation can be strategically chosen, um, and sort of debt intolerance, um, and and unfortunately, I have a bit less to say about that. No, um, there was in the beginning one. Oh, there's some new message. question in the beginning. Um, yeah. Um, cyclical government spending. Yeah, there's the one on government spending. No? So I think I always need to think a bit this through, no? but this idea of what, how inflation and government spending are related. So if the co it's, you're the UK, covariance between government spending and inflation is negative. And then at the same time, you have counter cyclical government spending, then you would end up not, or you would be able to put a relationship not between inflation and output. No? Uh, here, sort of uh, the relationship, no, whether it's counter-cyclical or not, doesn't matter as much whether government spending is counter-cyclical. What's more important is that the behavior of government spending with relation to inflation, no, because that's what the government cares about in its budget. Um, we have a couple of questions. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, there are more than that, wait a second. So, um, it says, as inflation link, that has kind of two parts, the face value and the value adjusted for current inflation. Since we would be receiving the value only after maturing a bond, won't that create a phantom revenue of sorts? And how does the effect the investor's point of view regarding them? So, um, yeah, so I see a bit this, a bit this phantom, no, a bit with the deflation floor, in a sense. No? So um, you have, you sort of spend some money to buy some inflation link that and then the return is indexed to inflation. So in real terms, the investment is safe, in a sense. Um, and, and what, in a world where investors are risk neutral, and I am working on sort of risk aversion, no? and how this relates, how inflation relates to um, the sort of stochastic discount factor and when inflation repays more. No? Fortunately, I don't have uh, all the results yet to talk about them. No. But in a sense, this sort of um, relationship between um, the interest rates or the price of debt is especially relevant when we think of the price of, in the model no, of nominal debt no, and how that influences the fact that the government might be forced to issue more or less inflation linked debt to cover its budget. Um, uh, Bishop asks, can you elaborate about the increasing high inflation pressure on consumers? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so the higher inflation is, in a sense, uh, in, in the model, no? Let me think a bit about uh, optimal public debt management and this idea of public indexation, which is what I know more about, no? Uh, in a world with very high inflation, uh, this would mean that the government cannot raise that many revenues from issuing nominal debt and would be forced to issue more inflation-linked debt. And this might be very relevant um, for emerging economies where inflation is very high. Now, as, as you know, for advanced economies, it seems like the problem is almost the opposite, now that we don't have enough inflation. Um, but for emerging economies, uh, it is true that, that the government would sort of move away from um, sort of nominal debt towards more inflation linked debt. And more lastly, during the pandemic lockdowns, inflation of prices of most goods and services slowed down. How was this, how has this affected the economies? What measures can be taken to improve this post pandemic? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. No? So, um, so in the, I mean, through the lens of the model, this would just be a sort of lower inflation. Um, but but in advanced economies, we're seeing a lot of concern, as I'm sure you all know, no, about sort of low inflation and how to sort of the US now recently in August changed its monetary policy framework to think or to sort of, I guess, um, signal that they are less worried about having inflation pick up a bit than than what they had been in the past. No? Having said that, this is a bit outside this paper. No, I've worked a bit on monetary policy and I sort of follow what has been going on as well. No? But I think, yeah, one measure that has been taken no, is sort of to signal that the uh, Fed is sort of um, parking the Phillips curve, for example, no? and that has been a big 
change in the US. Um, how can we measure the relation between economic growth and government expenditure? Um, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a good one. Mm. So um, this is a, a hard question. So in this model, you would just have it, the government would know, now in a sense, the correlation between output and government expenditure. In practice, this is um, the way I, I could do it in the model or the way I present the data is just sort of some correlations between the trended output and the trended government expenditure. That would be the relationship now. Uh, of course, if this is a causal relationship is another question, no? which is a much more, a much harder question, obviously. Um, can a, oh, can a decrease in public debt help control Excellent, excellent question. So yes, in the models I was presenting in the beginning in the literature, having less debt decreases the temptation of a government or central bank that is not a very um, independent central bank to increase inflation. Uh, and this is what a lot of this literature that people label lack of commitment literature shows. No? It shows that um, decreasing public debt erodes this temptation of deflating away. Yeah. It, this is not what no, the model that I'm presented did not have that, but this is what a lot of the earlier literature had said. Uh, during the pandemic, due to crash, cash crunch, governments tend to increase public debt overlooking the inflation. How can it be justified? Um, so, so I think that, and I think the, this question, the Pancho's question and Jagan Jan questions are a bit related, no? Because I think it's from my work on on this type of debt. I think it's important. I guess it depends what you think the how you think the country works, no? If you think that you have institutions such that there's some temptation to erode the real value of your debt, then you should probably decrease public debt, especially non-indexed public debt, no nominal debt. If you don't think that happens in certain advanced economies or in most advanced economies, then, then it's, so, it's okay, meaning these things are a bit independent. Inflation is going to be doing one thing that the central bank is going to try to do its best with. Um, related to unemployment, related to labor market night tightness. Uh, and on the other side, you have the government that has to finance some expenditures. Uh, and if you think these two institutions are separate, then increasing public debt uh, should not trigger inflation. If you think, you know, like Jajan's question, if you think that these two things are related, then maybe you should um, keep or, or, or maybe even no, increase public debt indexation, no? which is part of, of what I'm talking about here. No? This idea of, well, there are, public debt is a very broad, there's a lot of what I've done is this, no? thinking about, well, public debt is a very broad term. Uh, there are a lot of different assets out there. In particular, there are things that would not be affected by inflation and you would sort of um, give away, no, not give away, get rid of, that temptation to default. Um, why do countries hesitate to issue inflation linked debt? Isn't that a good question? That's what that's my big question, no? Um, that is my big question. I have to say something which is interesting, I think. I mean, I find it interesting, which is the UK during the gold standard effectively issued inflation linked debt. No, because its nominal debt was linked to the price of gold. So we have hun actually 100 or years of data, of data, of this experience. But then people, um, nominal debt seems to have a very special, um, I don't know, attractiveness for investors. No? They seem to understand very well, I put 10, they give me 10, no matter what. You know, 10 or 10.2 or whatever they give me. No? This is something that people love. They don't want, no? Um, but it's true, it's a big puzzle of why governments don't issue more um, what people call state contingent debt, no? uh, debt that repays more or less in different states of the world. Um, 
Is the debt issuance and inflation linked same for underdeveloped? No, no, big hoodie, no, I don't think so. No, I think the type of incentives and trade-offs in sort of emerging economies are very different. In particular, not this temptation to deflate that I have sort of parked no? by saying that inflation is taken as given and chosen by the government, sorry, by the central bank. Um, yes, this is a, this is a, this is a very different, and, and, but there is a lot of work or quite some work done on that. Um, Jajan says US owes so much to China in terms of debt, but yet US economy is strong at the same time. And the relation, what are your views on that? Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think the narrative, right? A lot of it is about how uh, issuing or having a lot or sort of having debt is bad news, no? And maybe for the US, uh, of course, I think that is influenced by a lot of emerging markets, sovereign debt crisis that we've seen, no? Um, and also European debt crisis for that matter, no? Let's forget that this is not only an emerging market problem, of course, no? Um, the US, a lot, there's some work done, which is not exactly what I've worked on, but I've looked at that literature um, talking about this sort of special uh, benefit you know, that say countries like the US have, you know, where they can issue a lot of debt. It also looks like, it almost looks like money, like people value it, purchase it, the interest rates are low for it or were low for it for a long time. And it seems like there is this narrative you now that issuing or owing money is a problem. And um, I guess my point is that it all depends on how sound your institutions are, how sound your budgets are, um, and maybe this special benefit that countries like the US have no? that others might not. Uh, so I'm, I'm personally from Spain, so maybe Spain doesn't have that, that luxury. You know? um, if countries' population is negative towards saving and favors spending more, how does this debt issue affect cash flow in the economy? Um, so, so I, in practice, a lot of this debt uh, in the US and other countries, also advanced economies in general, uh, a lot of the debt is um, issued and bought by foreigners. No? So uh, I guess my answer to this would be, uh, it could be that domestically, there is not that much interest in saving in this type of bonds. In practice, a lot of these bonds have been sold abroad. No, it seems like out there, there is some um, taste for, for this type of, of assets. No? Um, but yeah, that's, that's a question. No? I think public debt management, a lot of it is that precisely. No? How do you lure investors to, to lend you? No? What type of, of assets can you provide that they will want to, to buy? Sai says, if nominal debt has been adjusted following stabilizing inflation, but our economy is very volatile. If there's an immediate requirement for capital infusion, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it create a problem? Um, yeah, so in a sense, not nominal debt has been adjusted, meaning the real repayment uh, varies depending on inflation. Um, and what this model says, and, and this is something I said probably also applies to emerging economies, maybe in a different framework, but but probably also applies is that the higher the volatility of say the economy and probably inflation as a result, no, the, the, the more problematic nominal debt is. No? So then again, this sort of uh, public debt management can benefit. No? And maybe you can prepare in advance by issuing different types of assets so that you need less of this immediate requirement for capital infusion. Um, but but there but in practice there is probably a lot of this no? of sort of requiring some uh, additional issuance of some sort no. Uh, but I guess this this paper is about in advance trying to uh, issue in a way that that minimizes this impact of the volatility of inflation, for example. Um, Jajan says, can high public debt and inflation also be controlled at a very high stake by one specific country intentionally? Sometimes be, 
the economy scam or consider some irregular practice by one. Um, also be controlled by one specific country intentionally. Um, so, so, so I guess me, my answer to that would be uh, yes, not Jidan's question. So the, the, I guess the stronger the institutions, the more likely you are to be able to control public debt and control inflation, or especially inflation, I guess, because again, public debt mm, for many of these countries, it's a strong statement to say, no? But I guess through the model doesn't seem to be a problem, no? Um, but that's something I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how much, um, no? This is the model, no? and it has a lot of simplifications. In real life, things uh, might be different. So what is the point at which the public debt becomes too high? So um, really it's similar to this, no? which is um, this we enter some uh, tricky territories, no? some work that had been done about if there's a threshold or not and what happens with it. I don't think as a researcher in international finance in general, um, I don't think we have a consensus yet or not on when public debt becomes too high, especially not one number. No, probably depends a lot on the characteristics of uh, the country and sort of the how sound its fiscal policies are, how sound its monetary policy is, how um, the distinction or the division between um, monetary policy and, and fiscal policy. No? Uh, if the government depends on the gold sovereign bonds and fiscal deficit, um, ah, sorry, if the government depends on the gold sovereign bonds and fiscal deficit borrowing from outside of India, can we avoid from adjusting nominal debt? Um, so, so I think no. If I'm understanding your question correctly, Sarup, um, nominal debt will be adjusted by inflation just by just how the, the payment stream works. Um, or maybe you mean like decreasing the amount of nominal debt, you know? Um, so I guess, so in particular about India, I've looked at the Indian data as well, no? And I, I have here, it has issued very small amount of this type of debt. I think it was between 1998 and 2001, and then between 2013 and 2017. So it hasn't been a big thing in India. No, it seems like uh, almost you could say 100%. No? I think the share of inflation linked debt in Indian public debt is something like 0.04% or something very, very small. No, so, so I think most of it is issued in uh, nominal terms. And I think there is some, I don't know if a puzzle or not, but there could be some benefit there, I guess, to increase indexation. And I'm sure if I talk to the people in the government agencies, they can tell me a reason why they don't issue this type of debt. No, I just have not talked to them. But, um, but I think that it's an interesting question on the emerging economy side, no? or the sort of non-advanced economy side. Um, there's one question here. What have been the main factors behind the increase in public debt in emerging markets since the mid 90s? Um, well, that's a broad question. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that, and there's not work that, that um, or there's some work done on the currency composition of public debt. No? And since the 90s or so, a lot of uh, emerging economies, emerging markets have been able to issue a lot more of their public debt uh, in local currency. No, and ha that has meant that the usual concerns of currency mismatch between what uh, governments issue that used to be much more in foreign currency, this has been less of a concern. So one thing that comes to mind, because it's been, by the way, a sort of dramatic change no, and reasonably or quite fast you know, in the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so, or almost 30 years, I guess. Uh, so this idea you know, that currency composition has favored uh, local currency debt like it wasn't before the 90s, which has meant that a lot of the concerns maybe investors would have about what happens if suddenly the exchange rate depreciates, these people have to pay me in dollars, they might not have the dollars to pay me, 
all of this has disappeared or a bit disappeared is a strong word not mitigated no because we have uh, a lot more of the uh, debt has been issued in local currency this is one thing that comes to mind in terms of uh, because it's been a large change no in, in the sort of composition yes Thank you, Dr. Gomez Gonzalez. Uh, would you like to ask one more questions, or uh, how are you placed uh, with your time? Oh, I'm, I I can talk a bit more. Yes, these are excellent questions. Um, okay. Yes, okay. yes. So we will just take uh, two last questions. Of course, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's another one. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What is the reason why the government in the emerging markets have defaulted on their domestic debts through high inflation in certain countries? <laughs> this is also a very good question. Um, the way I personally see it from the way I've thought about some of these problems, um, but it might not be that satisfactory, you know, because the explanation I have is sort of almost Because there is this temptation, and there is this temptation, and you have to have this strong separation between the central bank and the government or fiscal policy to not uh, end up falling into the temptation. I don't know how uh, satisfactory that answer is, no, because it's a bit, I haven't, it almost looks because that's how they are, no, that's, I guess, another way to put it a bit. Differently would be something like, and I think there was a question about this. Now, what happens when you need a sort of immediate cash infusion or something, or you really are in an emergency and you need the money? You could even think, I don't know, maybe you are you're, you sold this debt abroad and you have um, this need for uh, poverty aid or uh, you know, something very urgent to help your domestic citizens. And that's what you end up doing. No? You end up putting the money to do it. Um, but I don't know how satisfactory that answer is, no? because it seems to say it's, it's who we are. No? And if we don't have enough good separation, we fall into these temptations. No? But it's a bit sad. Um, but I guess that's the only thing I have. Because if you think, no, the, mo the way I've thought about this model is, I'm going to turn that off completely. I'm not going to think about what makes the political economy of that possible or what makes the institutional characteristics of it possible. I'm just going to say inflation is out there, outside, outside the control of the government, and that's it. No. Um, it, it's sort of saying it is what it is, no, but it's not that satisfactory. But I think that's the only thing I have, no, this idea that there is a temptation, there is an emergency, and uh, some countries end up. Uh, sort of defaulting through inflation. And this has happened quite a bit. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Gomez-Gonzalez. Uh, I don't you. have any more questions uh, coming in. So if there are uh, more questions, I think uh, we'll write to you. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, we could wrap up today's session. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we've come to the end of today's session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gomez Gonzalez, for throwing more light on uh, inflation-linked debt and nominal debt. I'm sure our audience found your talk very interesting. Uh, we got to know that by the number of questions that were flowing in. This was great. Uh, so much, Doctor, for accepting our invite, despite the time differences uh, between us. Thank you for making it convenient to come at a time and we could listen to you. Thank you for the lovely talk and answering all the questions very patiently. I'm sure the students, faculty, and other guests have gained a lot by listening to you. Of course, there are, uh, there are more messages coming in telling that uh, they had a very insightful session. So you could oh, that's great to hear. I, yeah. I really, this, this was a lot of fun. It was, thank you very much for the invitation. The questions were excellent. I have a lot to think about. Uh, no, but I really appreciate all your time and attention and all the excellent questions that were brought up. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really, I really mean it. Thank you. Well, thank you, doctor. And uh, we really wish to have you on campus sometime soon. So when they come. Would be amazing. Travel. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. And I would. Thank you.
like to uh, thank our uh, Center for Research in Emerging Economies team, uh, Dr. Anirban Ganguly, Dr. Chitra Kalpa Sen, uh, and all the three team behind it for organizing this lecture series. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Uh, just before signing off, our next lecture falls under the Inspiration Lecture Series. It's on November 12th, so do come over. We have Dr. Dimitri Ivanov from the Berlin School of Economics and Law. We hope to see many of you there, so do share it with your network as well. And once again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gomez Gonzalez. We hope to meet you soon and host you on campus. Have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really thank nice you. meeting everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hmm.